Welcome to today's discussion, Experiencing and Reading Places, Philosophical Perspectives on Our Understanding of Cities. I know these are a lot of words, but what I want to do today is to address an easy question, which is how do we understand city? And the reason why I think this question is very important is because cities are very complex. And therefore, understanding how we understand them is a very important uh, question. It's, it's a very important problem. And cities, as you will hear all over this uh, class many times, are very complex systems, are uh, systems that are not just complicated, but they are complex, which means that many um, perspectives and many uh, components intersect in cities and make them uh, an object that is somewhat difficult to read, something somewhat difficult to understand. And um, the idea that we of how we understand cities can be broken down in different in different parts. And I really want you to uh, try to go over your understanding of a city uh, and see how you could use these steps in order to better figure out what is your the way you understand your city and then the way we understand our city. And when I talk about understanding, I talk about, first of all, experiencing your city, then reading and interpreting your city using concepts, using categories in order to understand, read and talk about your city. And finally, imagining your city. How do you imagine your city? How do you see and visualize what you can act cannot actually see. And therefore, the main questions that I want to address are, what is an urban experience? How is it different from a rural experience from the perspective of the experiences? And then what categories do we use to interpret cities? What is the mental image that we have of cities? And finally, how can we visualize what we, uh, what we can actually not see? Now, Starting from the experience that we have of city, um, one of the first people that thought about the consequences of living in a city for our mental life, for the experiences, for the kind of experiences that we have of the city is Georg Simmel. One of those German thinkers that basically did everything in his life as a, a sociologist, a philosopher, an historian. And um, Simmel thought about the consequences of living in a metropolis for in a metropolis for our experiential dimension, and um, he described the inhabitant of a modern city as having a blasé outlook. And by blasé outlook, Zimmel meant um, the necessity of the person that lives in the city to grow a protective shield that basically. Uh, is used as a defense against the overwhelming and endless stimuli that the city uh, provides us with. And the idea is really that we, the, the, the people that live in this modern city really have to grow this shield in order to be functional in the city, in order to navigate the city. But on the other side, this by growing this protective shield, people become also less and less involved in the life of the city. And this is another uh, side of the coin somehow, according to Zimmel. So on the one hand, we understand how to navigate the city, but on the other hand, we do not really get involved in the city. And a similar perspective on how the experiences that we have when we are in a city uh, are affected by the city itself is flaneur, is Baudelaire's flaneur. And flaneur means basically the stroller. And the stroller in this case is the typical bourgeois uh, that inhabits the city of Paris at the end of the 19th century. And as Baudelaire says in this short a fragment, the solitary and thoughtful stroller finds a singular intoxication in this universal communion. 
And by universal communion, Baudelaire means the crowd, the crowd that basically intoxicate the individual and doesn't allow him to be an individual anymore. And an individual in the crowd of Paris, according to Paris, is just a part of the crowd, doesn't act uh, from uh, uh, from 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 the inside doesn't have this individual uh, attitude anymore, and if Zimmel talks about the person that has this uh, blasé outlook, and then Baudelaire talks about the flaneur in the context of European cities of the nineteenth century, of this growing metropolis uh, that we see all over Europe in the nineteenth centuries. If we look at the American city, the city that uh, somehow is built around the idea of the single house and the single car, um, we can think about a totally different experience that someone can have in these cities. And therefore, the, the, the inhabitant of the city is not the stroller anymore, is not really overwhelmed by stimuli as the blasé outlook person is in Zimmel's case, but has a very different experience, an experience where thing goes by really quick and uh, many other dimensions of the city gets distorted and are very different from where you would, uh, the, the kind of experiences that you would have if you were just walking around a city. And so here we have three different kinds of experiences that we um, we can look at and that we can think about when we uh, drive or walk um, around our cities. Now, if we step uh, up from this level of the experiences that we have of a city to the level of the categories and of the concepts that we use in order to describe the city, we, we can start talking about the image that we have of a city. And Kevin Lynch, in his book, The Image of the City, published, published in 1960, really tries to study the mental image that we have or are of our own city. And by studying this mental image, Lynch tries to um, build mental maps of the city. And these mental maps are supposed to be able to describe and give shape to our personal experience of the city. These mental maps have uh, can be of very different kinds and have different parts that um, characterize them. And Lynch talks mostly about five elements that characterize a mental map of a city. There are path, paths, edges, districts, nodes, and landmarks. These terms are pretty self-explanatory, and I want you to focus on paths and nodes in your city. And how do we understand them? What are these paths? What are these nodes? According to Lynch, a path is basically a channel that someone, that an observer, can go through. And it, these are the main channels that people use in order to move around the city. A node is a place where many paths, many channels, somehow intersect, building up intricate uh, dynamics within one space. Now, if we think about our mental maps of, of our cities, we can find many kinds of paths. And uh, one of the thinkers that have has thought about these paths in a city and how they change over time is Walter Benjamin. He focused on um, the restructuring process of Paris during uh, Haussmann's uh, revolution and architectural and urbanistic revolution in Paris. And so he thought about the role of big boulevards that got rid of small little streets that characterized the urban texture of uh, medieval Paris. And he also focused on um, somehow these uh, arcades and this passage that 
uh, got created to connect one boulevard to another, and that represent a, an intersection of private and uh, public life in Paris. And um, what I want you to do is to think about the paths of your city by using um, these analysis, this uh, interpretation by, uh, by Benjamin. And for example, here we have the example of Lüneburg, but also if we look then at Phoenix, uh, we see that the paths are very different. And so how does it change when you have a city built around these highways and how also smaller interventions such as the light rail can change the dynamics of, uh, of a city. Um, when these paths intersect, we get nodes. And one of the thinkers that thought about this dynamic of intersecting paths is Max Weber. In an older text from the 1920s, uh, Weber think about, thinks about the European city, uh, of the Euro European modern city, as pivoting around the square market, the market square. And this market square is therefore the main node of the city. And he analyzes the economic function of the market in the way the city is, is structured and provides an economic uh, perspective on, on the city. Now, uh, if you think about Lüneburg, for example, you can still find the market and the square as a center, as a node in the city, but you also find other examples of nodes, as well as you can do in, uh, in Phoenix. But things are very, very different because in Phoenix, we don't have um, this uh, square or market anymore. It's not the kind of city that is built around uh, the market. You have the Scottsdale Fashion Square, you have the ASU campus, for example, as a big note in the city. And at the same time, what is supposed to be the center of the city, the downtown area, is not the center anymore, at least on a daily basis, but it can, becomes, it can become a center <clears throat> or occasionally, depending on events that the city of Phoenix hosts from on a regular basis, conventions, art walks, and so on and so forth. After looking at these categories that we use to talk about cities, I want you to trigger somehow your imagination and think how you can visualize and think about actually dynamics in the city that you are not able to see. And this is, for example, what Calvino does in his Invi Invisible Cities. Uh, for example, the city of Ercilia, where its inhabitants basically stretch strings from the corner of the houses to establish relationships uh, that sustain the city life. And in this case, uh, this city is basically a network of relationships, very similar to what a complex system is uh, in the way we think about them today. But also if we think about the city and its past, and we look at, for example, another one of Havino's um, cities, Zaira, and the fact that the city doesn't tell its past but contains its past in it. We can use this imagination, this, this process of imagining a city in order to understand, for example, the conservation of forests that we do in a city and how we preserve its past and how we get rid of part of its past, as we saw, for example, in Benjamin's analysis of Paris. Now, what I want you to do is really to take this material that I've briefly talked about and use it to read your city, both to understand better what's the experience that you have of your city and to build up an image of your city. And which finally means basically to start thinking about how do you, how would you build a mental map of your city. Um, and so this is the final uh, homework that I give you. And I hope you will have fun trying to figure out the map of the city and I will see you during the discussion in class.